Hey everyone, welcome back to another social studies lecture. Okay, uh, in this video, we're going to continue uh, with our issue three on globalization. Okay, and then uh, we're going to actually talk about the economic impacts of globalization. Okay, so uh, there's going to be three impacts you're going to learn about uh, unit 9, unit 10, unit 11. Okay, unit 9 is economic, unit 10, we're going to talk about cultural impacts, and uh, unit 11 about security impacts of globalization. Okay, so uh, there are three main ideas for this chapter. So the impact on countries, impact on companies, and the impact on individuals. Okay, so let's get started. Now, these are the learning objectives, okay, for this particular unit. Okay, just uh, take some time to just take a look. All right, let's go. So essentially, uh, you realize that globalization has positive and negative effects, right? So in the last chapter, we learned about what globalization is and how it's being driven in today's 21st century. So today, we're going to learn about the positive and negative impacts of globalization on the economy in these three factors, countries, companies, and individuals. Okay, so first, let's talk about positive impact on countries. So uh, when, okay, positive impact on countries, essentially, okay, what globalization brings is economic growth for the country. So why does this happen? So a country's economy is dependent on the activities, okay, that gives it its, uh, essentially, its economic activities. Okay, so when we have economic growth, this means that the uh, growth of the economy is in the positive direction. Okay, so with this, they allow the country to earn more tax revenue, create more jobs for the people, and raise the standard of living for the population at large. Okay, so with more tax revenue, countries are able to improve their infrastructure. Okay, so the population will benefit by enjoying better standard of living, greater diversity of goods and services. Okay, so be, uh, on the, the main way, okay, for uh, globalization, sorry, for countries to have uh, such a rapid economic growth, okay, is to participate in the global economy, all right? So uh, in order to achieve this and to achieve this, okay, we should usually uh, participate in the global economy. Now, this is especially true for Singapore, which has basically uh, zero to none, uh, sorry, uh, it's very small to none uh, local domestic market okay we are a very very small country uh, so there is really not much room to expand within Singapore and ourselves we don't have any major natural resources to rely on so uh, the, the most important thing for Singapore to survive is to pack ourselves to the global economy okay so that we can survive right so uh, be it for because of the small domestic market okay or we have limited natural resources all these things are essentially are inhibitors of our progress right so in order to manufacture we to sell to import export all these things especially to export to earn more profits okay we depend on the global economy to import raw materials for foreign expertise this is what we talked about last time and also uh, for the export of its products and services Okay, so this is why it is so important for Singapore to be connected to the global economy. Okay, so because of all these particular reasons. So uh, in order to sustain this growth in the, in the global economy, uh, Singapore must encourage foreign investments and at the same time invest in other countries. Okay, so uh, this is simply to, you know, uh, maintain our economic competitiveness on the world stage okay so we're going to learn two terms here foreign direct investment okay it will be this two and there will be one more called the free trade agreement which is right below uh not not yet okay we'll learn about it in a moment okay so uh essentially i want you to learn one major thing from this section here it's called diversifying the economy okay so uh when the economy is diversified what does it mean is that we transition the economy to focus on areas okay that may be more important in that time of age 
We can see this with uh, what Singapore's economy focused on from 1960 all the way until today. Okay, so in the 1960s, when we were a very young country, we had barely anything, we had no resource, we had no expertise, we had no choice but to rely on foreign investment. Okay, so during that time, to combat the immediate labor shortage following independence, we had to develop labor intensive industries like factories. Uh, yeah. Okay, so factory, manufacturing, stuff like that. Okay, but as time changed, okay, in the 70s and 80s, Malaysia and Indonesia uh, now became a better option for uh, MNCs, okay, to relocate to in order to, again, have the same uh, amount of things that are produced, but they can uh, pay the workers less, okay, because of the cheaper labor and uh, other costs there, okay? So, this is a problem for Singapore because now all the manufacturing, all the industries like that in Singapore all started to move to Malaysia and Indonesia, okay? So, uh, the entire industry essentially is just disappeared. So, we had to diversify it, okay? We had to ensure that we are not just putting all our eggs in one basket, right? We need to be able to transition quickly and uh, move to another industry which is more apt for that particular time and age. Okay, so what we decided to do is to focus on technology. So we had a foresight to see, okay, that technology will become uh, one of the most major uh, industries in the world. Okay, so we decided to focus on that since we already lost the manufacturing advantage. In the 90s, okay, we started to develop biomedical science industry, so chemicals, uh, technology, electronics, engineering, okay, stuff like this. This is what Singapore can do and is uh, meeting the demands of the world. Okay, so this is how we maintain a flow, you see, over the years. Okay, so more recently in today's era, okay, we are developing digital, interactive, media, and energy sectors. Okay, things that are uh, very important in the 21st century. Okay, so please be aware of what we mean by diversifying the economy. Some countries all the way since their independence until today, they focus on one main industry, for example, agriculture or manufacturing, okay? But Singapore, we cannot afford to do that because we simply don't have the resources and other countries have an advantage over us in certain areas. So we must not put our eggs in all in one basket. We must know how to diversify our economy, be good at a few things, and if need be, we shift our focus onto something else that uh, fits the demand of the, of the day and also uh, is what Singapore can do and is good at. Okay, so connecting with the global economy is important for Singapore, right? So uh, there are two main ways. We show this on the international stage. This is what I mentioned earlier, FDIs and FTAs. Foreign direct investment, FDI, okay, it refers to investment in a local company by a foreign company. Okay, so this is foreign to local. This is the investment here. Okay, so in Singapore, we actually encourage other companies and other countries to come and invest in our local companies. Uh, a bit outdated, but in 2013, Singapore received over $800 billion uh, in foreign direct investment. Okay, so we can see that, okay, actually Singapore is very, very successful when it comes to attracting uh, these foreign direct investments. Why? Okay, it's the same reason, remember? Uh, in diversity, we already talked about this. Okay, in the MNC part uh, of last chapter, we also talked about this. Right, it's the idea that Singapore is just so attractive for investment and there's so much potential for investment that a lot of people decide to come here and set up and establish themselves. And they do work. They do get a lot of profit. Okay, so they have confidence in investing in Singapore because we have opportunities because we have the standards, because we have the um, prospects here, okay? And they do, they reap the benefits and they get profits, okay? So we have good infrastructure, we have a prime location and whatnot. All these things are reasons why, okay? Uh, people willing to uh, directly invest in Singapore companies, okay? 
Okay, free trade agreement is different, all right? Remember, FDA and, sorry, FDI is not equal to FTA. Okay, these are two different ideas. They may result like this, okay? More for free trade agreements means more foreign direct investments possible, but they're not the same thing. Free trade agreements is agreement between countries where, this is the key point, right? goods and services can be exchanged freely without tariff, tax, or interference. Okay, so it's a free trade, right? I don't need to pay tax to import my things. I don't need to pay tax to export my things to your country. Okay, so this is amazing because there is great, great savings. Normally, if you're trying to export or import something, oh, the taxes is really, really a lot. Okay, so uh, by removing that requirement through this agreement, okay, between these two countries or multiple countries, right, they save a lot of money from not having to pay tax and also this will encourage okay more trading okay which is why i say fta can lead to more fdi okay because it's simply easier for import export and then it's more likely that people will want to invest here okay so one example of this fta is the us uh us um Singapore Free Trade Agreement, so US SFTA. Uh, so this essentially is to promote trade between US and Singapore, right? Be it uh, in the industries like electronics, chemicals, petrochemicals, so on. Okay, so uh, investing as you can see, yeah, uh, by having the FTA, it promoted trade between our two country, and then end up, okay, you can see ah, uh, investment in Singapore, American investment in Singapore was very very high much higher than any other country in the Asia Pacific. Okay, so this is the impact of free trade agreement. Now, uh, other Asia Pacific countries also, uh, based on this success, they wanted to join in, uh, essentially join the bandwagon of uh, getting FTAs. Okay, so this is what sparked the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, although TPP today is not in operation anymore i think it's defunct okay there's a new uh agreement okay also in the asia pacific region it is the rcep i think regional cooperative economic uh partnership i don't remember the name exactly uh because it's it's quite new okay it just happened in the last few years only okay so you might want to google up uh, some of this maybe you can use it as an example if you are able to understand it enough Okay, so this is uh, essentially is a free trade agreement, multilateral, multilateral, remember multilateral means between multiple countries, okay, multilateral free trade agreement for the Asia Pacific region. Okay, TPP is already defunct, essentially, okay, can, yeah, so as you can see, uh, be it economic trade or whatnot, it has significant improvements, or sorry, significant impact, positive impact. Okay, uh, there's also sometimes uh, additional benefits, for example, security and defense. Uh, because of our free trade agreement with the US, the SFA allows uh, American warships to use our military facilities, notably at the Changi, okay, where the American vessels stop before moving on to the South China Sea, okay, or Paya Lebar Air Base sometimes. Paya Lebar Air Base. Okay, so yeah. So essentially, we want to focus on this idea, okay? We want to build strong economic relationships through FTAs and FDIs, okay? So this, because this increases our revenue, remember, if we open ourselves up and we establish relations, economic connections with a lot of different countries, the amount we earn also increases, right? So yeah, so this is why we are doing this and also job opportunities because of the investment and also because of the MNCs that actually come to Singapore as well. However, of course, there will always be people against FDIs and FTAs. Why? Okay, because very simply, FDIs may not benefit domestic businesses. Why? Because foreign companies they never say they will transfer the knowledge and skills. Huh? No, they just invest only. Okay, so sometimes they may not be willing to do so, you know. Yeah, so this is the problem already. Okay, some more, they bring in their own foreign workers 
to work in say the MNC offices here in Singapore. Okay, so this is a problem because supposedly one of the benefits of FDI is that we have increased job opportunities, right? But no, because of this, uh, this is non-existent. So there may not actually be any employment opportunities for the locals. Okay, and then they also may not want to have economic links with the smaller companies in this in the country. For example, uh, homegrown companies. Okay, so this will not benefit the homegrown companies either. So as you can see, it's a negative plus negative benefit. Huh? so uh, <laughs> negative plus negative, negative plus negative, uh, problem here. Okay, so this is why some people are against FDIs, FTAs. Okay. FTAs will result in cheaper products being imported. Okay, so uh, because of the lack of taxes or interference within the import export between these two countries, okay, you realize that other countries can produce some stuff at a much cheaper uh, price and then they produce it in larger amounts than us. Okay, so more people will buy that uh, because you would, I mean, if you get the same thing, if it's the same thing, one is cheaper than the other, of course you buy the cheaper one, right? So, uh, a lot of these cheaper products come from overseas. End up, the people that are making the same product in local companies, they lose out. Because nobody want to buy a more expensive thing. Right? Okay, so uh, that is the problem of uh, FTA. So, poor sales and then end up closed factories and then becoming unemployed. Okay, so this is the obvious link here. Okay. So now that we talk about some positive things, okay, or rather some uh, more related to the economic growth side of things. Similarly, with globalization, we are also more likely to experience economic downturn. Okay, remember what our um, main principle of globalization is that we talked about in the last unit is about interconnectedness. Okay, for better or for worse, we are interconnected. In good times, we benefit. In bad times, we all suffer together. Okay, so when one country's economy is affected, this problem, okay, this interconnectedness factor will cause all the other economies to be affected also. Okay, this is one of the flaws of the global economy. Okay, so during economic recessions, okay, recession being uh, a decrease in profit, okay, essentially uh, it's kind of like a, um, a time where there is negative growth. Okay, that's kind of oxymoron, right? Okay, essentially is when uh, the, the pro profits and everything become negative. Okay, so we are losing stuff, all right? Uh, so the economy, when you, be, when you hear people say, oh, the economy is not good and all that kind of stuff, this is what it means. So slump is going down, recession is going down. Essentially, the economy is, is going down. It's not, it's not growing anymore. Okay, it's going in the opposite direction. So uh, essentially, during such a recession, okay, in order to protect our own country, okay, we may withdraw investment. We may... Uh, close off our uh, borders okay to import and export because we want to protect our own domestic economy okay the more we are connected with the global economy the more we will suffer during such a recession okay so yeah but in in effect <laughs> countries doing this will have a compounded effect as well okay if you realize if more countries start to shut their border uh, to trade and all that kind of stuff because of recession okay wouldn't those that's wouldn't those countries that still are open, okay, for trade and everything suffer? Yeah, because there's reduced trade, okay? So reduced trade. That's the problem. Lah. Okay, sometimes you may hear this being referred to as the protectionist mindset. Okay, protectionist. Okay, so one major example that you need to know is the 2008 global financial crisis okay so this is the most standard example for uh to show how uh, economic interconnectedness between countries can affect uh everybody around the world okay so uh okay so essentially i i won't go into too much detail about what happened okay all you need to know is the effect okay so essentially the weakening of the American economy in 2008 saw many people lose their jobs, 
okay and then there's less people wanting uh, certain goods and services so a lot of people because you're unemployed because you're losing uh, they don't have an income stable income anymore they were unable to pay back the loans on their investments or on their house mortgages okay eventually this led to a serious problem because the banks give out this loan but nobody was repaying the loan and not the bank lose the money so how do they what what do they do okay in that situation usually they foreclose many properties foreclose means take back possession of okay you have these mortgages all right okay you have these investments okay if you cannot pay us back we just very simple we just take the thing from you know if you are cannot pay back for your house we just take the house from you okay but the problem is the economy is already so terrible <laughs> The banks, in order to earn back their money, they have to resell these foreclosed properties. But nobody want to buy one. So, in the end, they could not recover any of the things that they lost. The, the loans, they could not recover. The people who got the loans, they also suffer. Everybody's suffering. So, the government had to give them financial support. So, because of that, a lot of banks in the US started to collapse. Because all these problems, compounded problems, you know, uh, you cannot pay back the loans, la, cannot sell this for closed property, they cannot earn back the things that they have lost, all started collapsing. Okay, and by extension, because a lot of European banks are connected directly to American banks, they also started to lose money. Because American banks started to collapse, started to decline, European banks being connected, they will also suffer the same fate. Okay, so they lost so much money that now European government have to give loans to the European banks. Okay, end up the economic slowdown in Europe ended up causing the entire problem to go worldwide. Demand in goods fall dramatically all across the world, which affects who? Manufacturing. Okay, you see, yeah. Let me just uh, write some stuff here. Maybe it's easier for you to visualize. US, okay, this is the whole uh, start of the problem is from the US. Okay, so when the US banks fell, European banks start to fall. Okay, when European banks start to fall, the problem now is that there is a lack of demand for certain things. And again, another ex by extension, uh, relations with other banks, right, and other places. Okay, so end up, all right, the economic slowdown as a result of these two issues here, okay, led to a lack of demand. And if European banks will actually link to uh, banks in other countries, they will also be affected. So end up, okay, it affected manufacturing countries and it affected banks in other countries okay so as a result the entire world felt the pinch of this economic crisis in china 20 million people lost their jobs around uh, around 20 million people jobs lost their jobs Nobody was investing in China already at that point. India, same thing, severe drop in FDIs. Unemployment rate spiked up, okay? Economy started to fall, okay? Or rather collapse. Singapore also, our local economy went into a recession, okay? Uh, no choice, uh. we have a domestic economy that's so small. So we have to be connected to the global economy no matter what, okay? So as a result, we are also affected by the 2008 financial crisis so what was done by the government for singaporeans is a few points here okay those who lost their jobs were retrained okay so they were essentially uh, guided to find a new job uh for that time itself you will learn if you're earning lower salary okay uh essentially you could actually uh, get rental rebate so you can get a discount uh, essentially on your rent for smaller companies, all right, they now have lower interest rates for their loans on the government and they have increased subsidies as well for premiums and also tax exemption. So they didn't need to pay too much tax uh, for their businesses during that time. Okay, so as you can see, uh, when we have a recession, stuff like a recession happening, 
okay it has a compounded effect okay this is what you call domino effect Okay, the domino effect okay so this is what happens when one country fall everybody start to fall okay because uh be directly being affected or as a result of a lack of demand all right things start to collapse internally okay so this is the domino effect of recession so globalization the negative impact is that there is a possibility of economic downturn because we are also connected one fail everybody fail Okay, now we move on to companies. Okay, companies. Let us start with the positive and oh actually it's the same thing lah, essentially. So companies, okay, just now we were measuring for countries, it was economy, right? Positive negative growth for the economy. Companies we use the term profit. Okay, you shouldn't be too unfamiliar with this term. Okay, we're using the term profit. Now one thing I want you to understand, one term you need to understand is called market share. Market share essentially means percentage of the market. Okay, so for example, uh, if we were saying like it was the phone industry or phone market, okay, people that are producing these uh, smartphones, uh, you could say Apple has a large, per large market share. What does that mean? Apple holds a large percentage of the entire global smartphone market. Okay, so naturally, bigger market share will mean that the, the company will earn bigger, uh, sorry, higher profits. Okay, on the other hand, okay, there will also be greater competition as a result of globalization. Okay, yeah, so positive impact. That's obviously the positive impact is higher profits, huh? Okay, so they can earn higher profits by expanding their businesses to all around the world. Okay, lower land costs, lower labor costs, cheaper raw materials, and at the same time gain access to newer places to sell their things and up profit increase. Okay, so lower costs, cheaper materials, new markets, profit increase. Okay, so uh yeah, so essentially uh the they can actually choose to manufacture in one place they can choose to procure their raw materials from another place and they can choose to uh you know assemble in all different kind of places okay so this is just a strategy uh, for a lot of mncs singaporean companies also okay we have been doing such things also we have been encouraging uh our companies to expand overseas to venture over uh, abroad all right and then we support them by giving them loan and tax incentive if they do expand overseas okay so this is another one of the singaporean policies here so what are the hallmarks of people that can earn a profit in this economy first open to change okay embrace innovation these two are the same we have to be open to innovation we need to be open to uh, change okay we cannot just rely continuously on the same strategy okay that's not going to work in today's fast paced fast changing world okay second okay uh we need to leverage on technological advancements okay creating products this is all linked okay this uh, these few are linked okay Le uh, leveraging on technological advancement same thing similar to innovation some industries can actually now rely more on um technological advancements okay to uh, <clears throat> appeal to even more people sorry yeah okay so um essentially the idea is that if we are willing to innovate and we're willing to uh try new things essentially okay we will usually be able to gain more profit uh, in such a competitive market today okay for negative impact okay negative impact will be about lower profits okay so same thing huh? i can earn greater profits from globalization but at the same time if i don't do it right my profits can actually decrease also okay so <clears throat> that's not what we say increase competition right so with globalization okay now you're not only competing with local company you are now competing with companies 
all around the world, from everywhere in the world, okay? So this global competition has made it difficult, okay? Like I said, you must be very constantly innovative in order to stay afloat, okay? You must be continually improving. You must be aware of the changing conditions in order to, keyword, remain relevant, okay? So one uh, bad example of this, okay, Neptune Orient Line. I didn't know, I don't know if you know, uh, but it is essentially the it used to be Singapore's uh, national shipping line, uh, shipping company. Okay, it became very profitable, okay, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. But at the turn of the century, from the 21st century onwards, okay, this company started to make a lot of losses. Okay, why? Because they didn't adapt to the changes of the shipping industry. People now use uh, automated uh, you know, sorting machines. They're using you know, faster routes. They're uh, updating their cargo ship model and everything. Okay, but NOL didn't. NOL still remain. Uh, still try to use their own old methods okay, to compete in this global economy. That's not going to work. going to fail miserably. Okay, so this is one of the examples that... Uh, you may or may not want to use that. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of other examples that you can think of. Okay, so generally, uh, when it comes to positive and negative impact on companies, okay, we are talking about gain loss of profit. Okay, so it can be both ways, uh, globalization. Uh, I want to spend a little bit of time on uh, talking about uh, small and medium enterprises, SMEs. Now, in Singapore, SMEs are very, very important. Why? Because they provide 70% of Singaporeans' employment. Okay, so with globalization, uh, now we are facing a bigger challenge because, like I said, we are now competing with companies in every part of the world. Okay, so because of that, a lot of local SMEs may be unable to compete with these bigger, well established MNCs that offer the same thing. So, apart from that, Singapore, a small domestic economy, you cannot just rely on domestic market. We often have people that are non-experienced, okay, or they are just very, um, you know, they are fresh grads and stuff like that, okay? So, all these problems compound each other, okay, and then SMEs in Singapore are facing a great threat. So, a lot of times, they are forced to close down because they really cannot meet the much larger competition from all these MNCs or foreign companies. Okay, however, same thing, if you're innovative, okay, you probably can meet the competition because you're doing something that people uh, didn't expect and then you're entering a part of the market that is very niche, okay, that's very unique to you. Okay, so innovation is a very, very important point. Okay, so the strengths of SMEs as compared to MNCs is that SMEs are established within this country itself. So they are more clear on what the people and what the economy of this country needs. Okay, what's the demand okay, of this particular nation? As compared to MNCs, which has so many branches everywhere, in this aspect, in understanding in the market analysis of this particular area, they suffer significantly. Okay? Sometimes SMEs also survive by pegging themselves to bigger MNC, they provide, uh, you know, support, they provide IT support, they provide marketing support, uh, stuff like this, okay? So, uh, you can see, as long as you innovate well enough, right, usually you will be able to stay afloat. Okay, and of course, government also needs to play a part here. We want to encourage, uh, we want to, sorry, we want to keep the SMEs alive. Right, we want them to because they are playing a very major part in our economy, right? So what do we do? We give them financial assistance, so loans, grants, tax incentives, and uh, like I said just now, venture abroad, and then linking with corporations. Okay, so the government is basically trying a a, a few different methods, alright, to get SMEs uh to innovate, okay, and also to be um. Uh, uh, be able to stay afloat in this competitive time okay yeah so the whole key idea okay essentially in this world for companies and individuals alike okay we go back to this point anticipating change and staying relevant sounds familiar because that is what we learned in principles of governance 
right all the way back in unit two okay so uh it applies here as well because as individuals as companies all right we need to continuously anticipate the changes in the economy and at the same time think of ideas to stay relevant in that changing economy only then then we can stay afloat okay carafower is i don't know if you remember carafower i'm not sure but uh essentially carafower was this very uh it's a french hypermarket chain okay but essentially it shut down operation because it has no even innovation there are other competitors in Singapore, so many hypermarkets, supermarkets in Singapore, they could not keep up with the competition and end up they had to close down. Yeah, but they still exist in Malaysia, in Indonesia, I think. Yeah. Okay, now we move on very swiftly to individuals. Okay, so gain and loss of income. Uh, same thing, positive and negative impact of individuals. Now we are using the term income. You realize that a lot of these example, oh, sorry, a lot of these explanations start to get similar. Yes, okay. So what is the only difference? The main difference is the keyword that you are using. Companies is economy. Company, sorry, country is economy. Company is profits. Individuals is income. Okay. So, with more communications, with more technology, we are able to collaborate with one another much more easily. Okay. So now we have also air travel. So we have greater collaboration possibility and we have the entire world uh, economy to pack ourselves to okay so if there's no jobs here in singapore a lot of people choose to go overseas because overseas may have more opportunities okay that's the good part of course same thing the bad part is always the increased competition versus a small domestic market with lesser competition now you're fighting against everybody in the whole world okay so that is the problem here with globalization with regards to individuals and jobs okay like i said because of transport because of technology uh, improvements okay now people can be able to work in countries just or even beyond their own countries okay in fact other places may have better work culture may have better salaries better opportunities better prospects uh, all these things okay will incentivize them to go overseas to work and sometimes with technology also you don't even need to leave your house. You can work from home <laughs> during the COVID times, right? We are also familiar with this idea of working from home. So yeah, with technology, we don't even need to leave the comfort of our own bed to go to work. And we earn quite a significant amount also. Okay, so as you can see, yeah, actually with globalization, okay, it has brought increased opportunities okay, for us to get uh, high income jobs and we get better opportunities as well. Okay, so uh, yeah, so that that is the interesting part about positive impact of uh, globalization on individuals. Now, of course, and the negative impact, uh, of course, competition uh, is always competition, right? It's now more difficult, okay, for people to find jobs because of the greater competition, right? It's always all linked back to competition. Now, it is also easier for them to lose their job because of cheaper labor possibility of cheaper labor same thing if you can give something another person can give another thing but they are willing to work for less why would the boss still keep you okay the boss will probably hire somebody who can give the same work okay but i have to pay them less okay so this is the risk here okay losing your jobs is the risk is much higher also companies may just close down and relocate because it's cheaper overseas like I said, land cost is cheaper, labor cost is cheaper. So they just, they just might stop shop here in, in one country and then they move to the cheaper country. And up, you also lose the jobs. Okay, so this is happening in the US, right? That's why uh, currently there's a huge debate in the US about, you know, made in America. There's always this slogan, made in America. And, uh, you know, stop the, the companies, the US companies from moving over to China, to India, stuff like that. Okay, why? Because... US people are losing their jobs. What if companies move over to cheaper countries like China, India, Vietnam, Philippines, stuff like that? Then Americans who were originally working in these companies they lose their jobs because the company move overseas. They cannot possibly go overseas unless they're very like loyal and all that, right? Yeah. So as a result, okay, this also affects people's livelihoods. Okay, it affects your uh this term called job security. Okay.
Yeah. So uh, today, because of globalization, the keyword is change. Okay. It is a changing world. Okay. Change happens so, so frequently. Okay. So we have to keep up. So we, uh, in order to do that, we must be adaptable to change. If not, we will lose out. Okay. We cannot meet the competitions. Okay. So the problem here is that unskilled workers, they are really lowly paid and they must be content with it because it's difficult for them to find alternative jobs because they already don't have skills. Whereas skilled workers today, same thing, I can be replaced by somebody who's willing to work for much less but still have the same skill as me. Okay, so uh, it's really, uh, it's not a very good situation uh, if you think about it that way. Okay. So, how can we maintain relevance, okay, in this changing economy? Very simple. Government has introduced a few things. First one, the CET master plan. Continuing education and training master plan. Essentially, it is a, it's a program, okay, for Singapore workers, okay, to continuously uh, train themselves and then make them relevant in this technology changing world, okay, through education, essentially. Okay, for older workers, we have something called the WTS, which is a Workfare Training Support Scheme. Okay, so this scheme allows them to essentially upgrade their skills and remain employable. And now, because they have more skills, they are, able, they are more eligible for higher wages. Okay, so what I want you to focus on is mainly this one and this one. Okay, so the Workfare Income Supplement. Okay, it's essentially lower wage workers, the government will supplement their lower wage uh, income, okay, to support them to continue working in their current jobs. Okay, so ensuring that they have enough uh, to live off comfortably lah, in their jobs, despite being in a low wage work, I'm sorry, low wage uh, job or being retired. Okay, so uh, this, if, if you remember, uh, we're talking about income, income, sorry, uh, minimum wage okay so this is Singapore's version of a minimum wage if you didn't know that Singapore actually we don't have a minimum wage okay how we supplement that is by schemes like this like, like the WIS and stuff like that okay because uh, minimum wage will not work in Singapore's very small economy okay so uh, essentially uh, you can read more about that it's not directly part of your syllabus but I think it's worth a good read as well okay why we don't have a minimum wage in Singapore okay the second one enhanced grant okay so essentially is a government grant that gives uh, people the money okay to pay for personal upgrading skills and courses okay and this is directly uh, linked in fact is probably uh, more uh, absorbed into this point skills Future, ah, our favorite, skills future. Okay, skills future essentially is the epitome of lifelong learning. Or rather, it is the thing that drives lifelong learning. So, it's the idea that, okay, the movement to push people to develop to their fullest potential and continue to get skills, okay, throughout their life, okay, even though they may be getting older and, uh, you know, in, in a stable job, but they still need to, maintain relevance uh, by actually uh, developing their potential in this way okay so if everybody follows this idea okay and develop their potential Singapore will become a very very advanced economy very soon okay so the main objective of skill future is for individuals to make informed choices okay to develop a high quality education system okay to recognize career development and give them help and most importantly, lifelong learning. Okay, so if we retrain, okay, especially for people who are retrenched, means they are being uh, uh, fired because uh, the company cannot sustain their employment anymore. Okay, retraining is so important. And even if we are still in our jobs now, okay, it is important that we continue to develop skills so that okay both of these things will allow us to maintain our relevance in this economy okay and that's why skills future exists 
Okay, so that is it for this unit. All right, so we have learned about uh, uh, the positive and negative impacts on countries. We have talked about it in companies, focusing mainly on SMEs. And now we have talked about uh, individuals, so positive and negative impact of globalization on individuals as well. Okay, so I know this chapter is a bit dry, it's a bit boring, okay, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's very important, especially for a lot of you who are going to join the economy, uh, join the workforce very, very soon. Okay, so I think it's very important for us to understand this point. And uh, as we prepare for 2023, and you know that inflation currently is super high, and the fact that there is a very high possibility of a recession occurring sometime this year or next year okay according to some reports okay all the more necessary it is for you to understand this point okay so this is very basic level economics i mean i wouldn't even call it economics it's just a uh, basic level understanding of the economy okay so that's all i have for you for today's lecture okay if you have any questions same thing please feel free to leave your questions in the comment sections below okay uh please don't forget to like and subscribe okay we spend a lot of time and effort making these materials and videos for you guys okay i really hope that this has helped you understand a little bit more about the globalized economy around us and uh, i hope it will help you in your revision as well Okay, so I wish you all the best for your upcoming assessments and all the best for your revision towards your O level at the end of this year. Okay, so I will see you guys in the next lecture. Bye-bye.